news this week? Yes. How many, Terry? 16. 16. Thanks, Hard to believe. Years. You can say, you see us up here. Wayne and Dixie, you look familiar. The background looks like a Harold and Beth Sink kind of kitchen. Are you there? Yes, we are. Very good. I'm glad to see you. Thank you. Leah, Leah wanted to show you her thing she got at Twin Lakes. Oh. <laughs> that was squirrel. We'll tear up the garden. There you go. Back, back this up. is the best kind. Yeah, the tough ones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Glenn looks a little uh, empty. Well, I know. <laughs> that house is anything but empty. <laughs> We're probably going to have the CDC upset with us. There's probably 18, maybe 19. At well, the Glen House? More than that. It's a 20. <laughs> Lewis's are on. Did everybody see Emma Lewis driving this morning? <laughs> wow. Oh, is that why my insurance went up this week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were you, you were driving, Emma. Yep. Is that permit or your license? My permit. Mm -hmm. so how old are you, Emma? I'm 16. Okay. I was wondering why your dad looked so tense this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, are you allowed to drive with Nina? It's Nina, you're over 21, aren't you? Yeah, I'm 23, but according to Indiana State law, you have to be, I think, 25 to drive with a younger sibling. So I can only drive with Hannah. Yeah. Yeah, Israel can't drive with Hannah either. Jared, I think, is the only one he can ride with. Uh, okay. So well, there's the Hannah Waltz. Hi, Dixie. Hi, Wayne. Good morning. Uh, you're still, you're, oh, are you still muted? Oh, Harold's muted you. Well, their mic is being shared. Yeah, Bill. Oh, mic is being shared. The Hannibal, the Hannibal well, they're at your place. <laughs> I yeah, didn't know so we've got to mute at least one side here. I didn't know how you were doing that. Well, we don't either, but we're trying. <laughs> that works. Very good. Somebody, who else was, oh, yeah, it was the goods that had the uh, Lewises over at their place last week. Was it last week? Yeah. Two weeks ago. Yeah, that was last week. And they didn't seem to care. They just ate in front of all of us. <laughs> yeah. But we gave you an extra 30 minutes to eat. Oh, there's John. And no Jana. They're out on the porch. John's yeah. out on the porch. Woohoo. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, Sean and Missy are outside. What did you do? Did you put it on a tripod or something? No, it's a, tray. yeah, we got a TV tray and we got our swing in the back. We're using nice. the computer. Huh. I have to get my sunglasses. Uh, we'll have to mute it every 20 minutes when the train goes by, but. <laughs> or a loud car. <laughs> Why, is it that frequent, really? Can be. Yeah. At night, I think it slows down. Brian would know, but it's, it's pretty awesome. So, Bill, it goes about as often as it by your house as it does theirs. I know. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> and it depends on which direction that it's delayed a little. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, we have Franklin and Main Street right next to us. So we get the horn more than anybody. And Monroe. Monroe's actually pretty close, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just loud. Stewart's are closer to the tracks. I don't know if they hear the... Franklin one as much, but I've been in the I've been in the Stewart's house when it goes by, and it, it's amazingly uh, not as loud as you'd think. You get used to it. Now, Ann and I camp in the backyard, 
you get used to it like that. <laughs> you heard it every time. And then our furnace makes a loud whoa, 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 whoa. It went off every 20 some minutes. It was a cold night. It was the worst camping we ever had. Um, At least for him. Yeah, for me. I think Anna slept all night. I think I remember, I think I remember camping at Hershey Park, you know, near Hershey, PA, they have a big amusement park and there was a train that went through their camping. Wow. Yeah, man, that, that was startling. I think it'd be hard to sleep with the smell of chocolate in the air everywhere. Actually, it put you out. I mean, you're, you're drugged. Oh, uh, you know, like in Florida, you can smell oranges. Yeah. How many of you have been in Hershey? You literally can smell chocolate. Yeah, I know. That's why I said that. Ugh. It was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful smell. But it smelled great because it was milk chocolate, not this dark chocolate stuff. Oh, that, Bill, come on. No. That's the best stuff. Milk chocolate. The, the street lights were Hershey Kisses. Yeah. <laughs> You know, no one ever talks so fondly about Decatur, Illinois, or, uh, or Lafayette with Dayton and Lyle. Yeah. That's corn. We all like corn. It doesn't smell good. like corn. The smell, the smell of the hog farm is always pleasing. <laughs> smells like money. That's what my dad always said. Smells like money. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's what we talked about, the paper mill in Wisconsin Rapids, too. Oh, uh, it's horrible. Why yeah. did it smell? Pretty bad? Yeah, they do. Oh. I grew up there, so you know it was just normal. No, just... Not everybody's house smelled like that. <laughs> uh, we lived near Niagara Falls, New York, and there was a big chemical company called Derez, and they were the ones responsible for the contamination of the Love Canal in uh, Niagara Falls. <laughs> but I remember driving. Uh, because we live not far from there, it drives to Niagara Falls, and you could smell that plant, the chemical plant, and it reminded me of uh, Tate and Lyle, because it, it smelled kind of like that. <coughs> it was nasty. I, I promise you it's worse on the inside. I bet it is. <laughs> yeah. It sticks with you. My first time, we spent eight hours at Tate and Lyle, first time I've ever been there, smelled horrible. Came home and my brand new wife made something for dinner with a side of corn, <laughs> and I couldn't eat it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I can eat corn now, but that was the wrong thing for dinner that day. Well, she was brand new. What is she now? Better, like <laughs> long. <laughs> Get Good answer. Oh. Good answer, Sean. Good answer. Uh, he can think on his feet. <laughs> Oh, oh, I cling, 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 cling. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, Memorial Day weekend was our 13 year anniversary of, of meeting each other. Yeah, that's true. First time we made out, too, but we didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Anna. I'm joking, Gianna. <laughs> she doesn't know. Uh, Anna's in the house. She's finishing up her lunch. Now, Wayne and Dixie, you you married pretty young, didn't you? So can you remember that first date? How, were, how old were you? That's been a long time. I bet it is. Oh, we said 12. 12. 16. 16, 17. Really? You married at 16 or you dated no, no, first? No, no, no. We weren't married until about July of uh, 52. Well, how old were you then? 18. 18. Wow. Did you guys have to get permission from your parents or not then? Not at 18. Not at 18. Yeah, you're going to have to close the door and tell them. I think we got a bigger crowd than last week. Yeah. I'll keep my eye on them. Yeah, I mean, we got five more. 
It was good that you moved it back to 130. We barely made it. Yeah, last week. Yeah, no, no, we didn't make it last week. Oh, yeah, so I mean, hardly we anybody's eating. With, we got yeah. done with lunch at 128. <laughs> wow. So. Well, you know, it takes, it takes Jan a while to uh, prepare a five-course uh, dinner after, after church, so. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is rough after not having our fellowship meals like that. Yeah, it is. It's tough. I was, I was talking to Tony, and he asked about Rose, and I started to tell him, and he did not know anything about her uh, accident. And I finished talking to him. Um, I was already on my way out, and I remembered that I didn't even say anything about Rose losing her mother. And um, so, um, yeah, I forgot about Tony. I mean, I. He doesn't have email. He does well. He used to get email. He'll get texts. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what he gets. I think maybe he has no internet now. He doesn't have internet, but yeah. he has a cell phone and um, uh, he was wanting Rose's phone number at the rehab place, but I didn't have it with me. So if you could, uh, somebody yeah, could. I'll, I'll send it to him. That would be good. Yeah, I feel bad. I, I forgot about him. Yeah, you might tell him about I, her mother, too. Yeah. Yeah, email sure makes it easy. I have to admit. I click it once and it goes to all of you. That's easy. Oh, so, Bill, I have a question. Um, is it after the, so next week is the uh, pot or the, the picnic? And then are we planning on getting back to a regular schedule a bit more after that week? Uh, we've really not talked about it. So we don't know yet. I'm going to take a charismatic position on it and uh, just leave it as, as the spirit moves. Yeah. <laughs> By spirit, you mean coronavirus? Hey, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Wise guy. No, I don't know. We, Harold and I haven't had a chance to talk about. Really, we are taking kind of one week at a time. Yeah. And, uh, see what happens. Yeah, I noticed Harold was. Uh, hey, Joey. Think quickly there before the service when all of a sudden there were some new people that came in that that hadn't registered. He had to find seats for them. Well, I guess they kind of found their own seats. Uh, you know, we, we kind of lost them there getting seated. But we did get them a visitor's card, and they apparently are looking for a church. So how they who ended up with about? us today. Uh, who, what's that? Who is that? Who, who are you talking about? Was visitor? The couple, the, the couple that the sat wife. in front of the Rogers. Okay. And then there was the single guy. Yeah. Joe Strum. Yeah. From where? Clarksville. Clarksville. Is he the guy that was emailing you, Dad? Yes. The couple that sat in front of the Rogers, they did fill out a visitor card bill, and I did put that on your desk. Oh, okay. Are they from Delphi? Flora. Yes, Flora. Yeah, Flora. Did anybody know them? They don't have a church in Florida. They just were looking to start going to a church. I'm not yeah, sure what in Delphi, but I think I remember was... him that he he said they've lived in Florida like for a few years. So I don't know anything about them. But yeah, if they left the contact information, I told them I'd contact them this week. So I'll get. What that. was their name again? I don't remember. Chris was his name. I don't remember her name. Oh, not the last.
Good. Where'd you put it, Patrick? On my desk? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I put it right there on your desk in the middle, so who knows where it is now. <laughs> it does kind of blend in, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I do. I When things get started, I'm going to have that desk cleaned off. Sure. Okay. Sure you are. Oh, what a it's, funny remark. It's bad. <laughs> I always clean off not, oh, well, I don't always. I try to clean off Nana's desk before she comes in. <laughs> Actually, Bill, I do like to on yours. Desk. Bill, I like What's to see that? you on laptop computer to work at your desk so you'll leave the rest of the office alone. Yeah. I really, I really don't do a lot in the, uh, I mean, I'll walk in and get books, but then I always bring them out to the secretary's desk. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a computer in there. At least I don't set it up. You have, there's three desks in those two offices and you have stuff on every one of those desks. I do, don't I? <laughs> yeah, what a bummer. Well organized. <laughs> yeah. Some things well, never change. What did, what did you say? Uh, uh, John, I mean, my desk looked like yours. Oh, the Hi. I probably Hi. said that at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Hi. I actually, Hi. I actually wrote a math paper once because <coughs> I, I, Hi, I discovered a, uh, a a mathematical identity uh, because of my messiness. Because I, I wanted to calculate something, uh, <laughs> I calculated it, and I got a formula. And I wrote it on a piece of paper, and then I decided it wasn't useful. And then the, a couple of days later, I decided it was useful, but I couldn't remember the formula, so I recalculated it. But I, but my answer looked different, and then and I couldn't find, and I had to recalculate it because I couldn't find the paper. So then I dug through all the papers and I found the two formulas, and they looked different. And so I just realized I must have proved that these two things are the same. So I actually wrote a paper about that where I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> the messy desks yeah. have a probability. Yeah, yeah. It has, it has purpose. It has purpose. Yeah. You've got too much time on your hands, John. I... <laughs> yes. Yeah, the name was Chris Doherty. And Bonnie. Because I remember him telling him that I have relatives that have that last name. Doherty. Oh. What, Terry? I know them. They visited years ago. And they visited they? before. Chris and yeah. Bonnie Doherty. Yes. 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 Yeah. She has white hair, too. <laughs> they live no, on great. Columbia Street. Yeah. yeah. Great. Do you know them, Terry? Yes. I mean, you know, it's been... Like I haven't talked to him since I retired, so that's been a few years, but uh, okay. yeah, yeah. How long do you think they lived in uh, Florida? A long time. A I was long time? Years, 20 years. Oh, really? I was thinking he told me it wasn't very many years he lived there, but okay. But, you know, he could have, it sounded like he said three years, but he could have said 20, 23 years or something. Who knows? He worked for FEMA. I, I don't know if he still does or not. He worked for who? FEMA. Oh. Federal Emergency Management. Okay. Or whatever that is. Somebody sounds like a vacuum's going. Do you guys hear that? Yeah, the, the Lewis's have some background noise. How'd you pinpoint the Lewis's? Because their frame, their frame yells up on my screen when the noise comes on. I got you. Who was that, Laura? Yeah. Got a fan going, Nina, or a humidifier? Um, yeah. I'm not sure what background noise is. Maybe we have a like birds outside. But our windows are open, so maybe it's some animals outside making noise. Oh, it's a it sounds mechanical. Yeah. Just tell everybody your mom's vacuuming very diligently, caring for the house, vacuuming <laughs> everything. Nope, mom's sitting right here. <laughs>
Give you credit, finally. Go ahead and mute everybody. Just do go through the announcements. Just were very briefly. Yeah, and, it, and really the only thing I wanted to go over is for uh, next week, the picnic. Again, understand that the format's changed a bit, that it's not going to be a pitch in, but please provide food for your, for your own family and bring your own table service and beverages uh, for that. Uh, there will be bottled water available, um, but, uh, but please bring your, um, your silverware for, for that time. And it, it'll be very simplified. It'll be the meal that we'll be able to spend time together in fellowship. Uh, uh, there'll be, we'll sing a few songs and then a, a devotional. We, we will not do the, uh, the games as we normally do, but you would be free, free to walk around the park. Um, I think it's supposed to be in the upper 80s near 90 next, uh, next Sunday. So, um, so pro probably plan according, accordingly for that. Bill, I think that's all I had for announcements for the, the near term. Do, um, you know, it'd be another week or so before the ladies fellowship, correct? Yeah. yeah. And it's here? It's here. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not going to read the whole text again. Uh, I should have looked it up here. But I'll read from verse five. Uh, Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, Paul said, um, that is of uh, the lawless one being revealed, son of destruction, uh, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he'll be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken away, out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they didn't receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they'll believe what's false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Uh, hmm. My overall point was obviously God's sovereignty in this, um, but maybe a little more precise here. Um, obviously, <laughs> I mean, it says here that God's going to send upon them a deluding influence so that they won't believe what's true, or rather will believe what's false. I think a lot of people become shocked at statements like that because they have a different view of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty, God's sovereign in the minds of, I think, maybe even most Christians, God's sovereignty is uh, seen in general terms. I don't think there's any Christian that doesn't believe in God's sovereign. But to hear it this way, that God sends a deluding influence so that they will believe, literally believe what's false. That's not passive. That's a very active position, uh, proactive position on the part of God, I guess, the Covey people would call. And actually causing the disbelief and the... Uh, embracing falsehoods. So let me uh, ask this question. How can God predestine the man of lawlessness and, of course, those who follow him for judgment? How, do they, how does God predestine this for judgment and yet hold him and these people accountable? And can God be blamed 
for his rebellion that as the man of lawlessness and their disbelief. Pastor, how different is uh, that condition than uh, what God did during Moses' time to keep the Pharaoh in Egypt where his heart was hardened, that he, he didn't want to trust or believe anything that the Lord said would happen? Is it, is it similar or, or different? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's all the same. It's Romans 9, where, where obviously Paul brings up Pharaoh and the hardening of his heart in Romans 9. It's just, you know, it's just shocking. I mean, of course, I've, I've embraced these truths for a long time now, and some of you, uh, I remember Jerry Dill talking about how this isn't strange. These are things that he's always believed, at least when he became a Christian. And I mean, I don't know, Sean, are you that way too? I mean, uh, I don't know how everybody, how you grew up. I didn't grow up learning this myself, but it's, sometimes it's shocking to some people, obviously, that didn't grow up in this. But yeah, yeah, Deb and I both would said our our experience growing up in church, this would be heretical that God would have uh, done this to these people that they would believe falsehoods. Any comments? I mean, does God, does God have a right to hold these people accountable? He causes these things to happen. Bill, this is so simple, but I've always thought of it as if I dropped a ball or a ball bearing in my hands, it's going to fall because that's the nature of, of creation. There's gravity. And if God in one second releases us from, from his common grace, we're going to do what nature, uh, what our nature is going to do, which would be a sin. sin. Uh, now, it doesn't quite answer as, why does God hold us accountable if he's the one that dropped us, but... Uh, it's in our nature to sin and to defile all holiness uh, because of the nature of sin. And all God has to do is let us, let us loose, so to speak. Yeah, there seems to be two views on predestination and God's sovereignty. You know, I remember R.C. Sproul talking about how God pretty much just takes his hands off uh, these people and allow them to go their way, which they to allow them to go their way would be a hardened heart position and a rebelliousness against God. And then there's the uh, predestinarians, and I'm probably more like that uh, as far as some would call it a superlapsarianism or double predestination, that God actually hardens the hearts of these people, as he talks about in Romans 9. I mean, I remember hearing a message that Sproul gave, and Sproul's position was less active, more of a passive. He just allows people to go their way. But the language of Second Thessalonians 2 here doesn't sound passive at all to me, as Romans 9 didn't sound passive. And yet, Romans 9 is the passage that answers the question, are these people still responsible? And is it unfair of God to do this? And that in Roman eight, Romans nine is the answer to that. Were you going to say something, John? Yeah, um, I think another way uh, that I think about it is that it seems unfair when we think about that—that that God's hardening their hearts. The the reason it seems unfair is because we sort of are in our own mind thinking that prior to this, the person was either neutral or in a positive state with God. And then God went and hardened their hearts and made them in a negative state towards him. But that's not the case at all, right? right? We start out in a negative state against God. We don't deserve anything, anything good. And so if he hardens our heart, it's only because we deserve it, 
okay? Right. And, and any grace that we have uh, in any other way is undeserved, and, and, and we don't deserve that either, and it's God's prerogative to do that. But the, the, the real, uh, I think, uh, this is another thing R.C. Sproul said in a different context, but he talked about people upset about the, the innocent natives being sent to hell. And, uh, and, and R.C. Sproul said, well, of course, if, if any innocent native out there, God will not send them to hell. He said, well, the problem is there's no innocent natives out there. They're all guilty too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's part of the way I think. Yeah. Yeah, if we just back up the question farther. They, they presume the innocence of man and don't go back far enough. Sean? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't take the complete passive view. I mean, think of, I think it's Second Kings. Well, uh, God intentionally sent a lying spirit into the prophets uh, to speak to Ahab and to lead him astray. Uh, God was very active in that deception. Uh, as for his judgment, just like we see here in Second Thessalonians, uh, as a deluding spirit. So how, how does Paul, you know, Paul doesn't defend God, but how, what is Paul's apologetic on this dilemma in Romans 9? How does he answer uh how did paul put it i mean uh is there you talking about where he says i will have mercy on who i will have mercy and i will have mm -hmm. compassion on who i will have compassion yeah who resists his will why does he still find fault? In other words, those are the questions of God's fairness. Of course, we know the answer. Who resists as well? Nobody. And why does he still find fault is more like, okay, so he hardened Pharaoh's heart. So why does he still find fault in Pharaoh? That's kind of the fairness question. So how does Paul answer that objection? Who are you? Yeah. He chides us. I mean, it's a rebuke. Who do you think you are standing in judgment of the righteousness of God, basically? Does not the potter have a right over the clay? What is his argument? Yeah. So it's, it's basically the creator-creature distinction, i.e., He's the creator, we're the creature. He's the potter, we're the clay. We need to know our place. That's Paul's first answer. And that's very abrasive to the rebellious hearts of uh, his creatures, us. And uh, I remember, maybe it was Sproul, I don't know who it was, but until you get this reaction to that type of answer from God, you're not understanding the question, you're not understanding Paul's answer. It should, you know, the, the human heart reacts against that. Naturally reacts against that. So, yes, everybody's still held accountable, even though he, he's a part. Let me ask you another question. Since false teaching so subtle and deceptive, how can we be on guard so as to not be taken in by it? False teaching... It's all around us. And really, the false teaching is way back in the inception of the church. I mean, the, 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 the apostles were dealing with false teaching by the Judaizers. So, it, it, you know, it's never left the church in that sense. But it, it's subtle. It's deceptive. So how can we be in guard so as to not be taken in by it? Bill, it's like the people that handle money, they, they know what the genuine bill looks like. So if they can see the counterfeit when they know what, what is the true and genuine thing, that's what we have to focus on is, you know, do, knowing the truth, knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's huge. But I always have people who aren't taught well. 
Is there any other safeguard for them? Of course, we can't always be taught perfectly. I mean, obviously, uh, even, even ministers struggle with it. So is there another possible safeguard to that? I, I, I've always felt the, uh, uh, the source should always be the word, the Bible. And there, there are uh, a lot of the false teachers, ministers, even famous televangelists who never crack open the, the, the Lord's word. They, they never open up the book. And you know, if they're not basing their, their uh, com content, their comments on the Lord's word, uh, the Bible, uh, then, the, then you got a good, strong foundation yourself to know that uh, you're probably not being taught right. Right. Yeah. And Bill, yeah. I, uh, this sounds kind of cheap, but just faithfully obeying the gospel uh, at least ensures that God's not going to send you a deluding spirit, because uh, God sent that spirit to those who were being disobedient to His word. Yeah. Yeah, we all need wisdom. I mean, I think of the Proverbs, the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. Of course, there are people who surround themselves with bad counsel, too. But I, I know that there are people in our fellowship and, and others that I can go to to get counsel and uh, help me think through stuff, not be real quick to take positions. Um, I mean, that, that, there's wisdom in that. Um, yeah. I mean, finding people who love the word and are, are wise about it and that aren't going to tell you what you necessarily want to hear, find those people. I mean, those are the ones who really help us, for sure. Uh, is there a difference between not receiving the truth. I mean, let me read this passage. Not receiving the truth and not receiving the love of the truth. I mean, what, what are the implications of this? Let me just read it one more. Ah, keep turning. Um, verse 10, and with all the deception and wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. <clears throat> and then uh, for this reason, God sent upon them a deluding influence so that they'll, be they'll believe what's false, in order that they all may judge who do not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Do you see any um, difference? And, and maybe why there's a, why Paul framed that way differently. In one case, it was the love of the truth. In the other case, it was the, they didn't believe the truth. They didn't receive the love of the truth. And the other is they didn't believe in the truth. Any take on that? Boy, nobody, no takers. Yeah, Bill, I mean, the, the only thought I had was that, you know, it, as a lot of the testimonies of new believers is that they, when they hear God's word and they, they flee to Christ for salvation, they very quickly develop a hunger for God's word. They love it. They, they, our lives are, Everything finally, to me, the, this phrase I use, everything finally made sense when I opened the God's word and understood it. You know, that's a work of God in, in, in my life. And I think that the difference is these people would reject that and, and actually, you know, to take it to its fullest, they preferred lies over the truth. They preferred to... You know, they didn't love the word, so they minimized the authority of God's word. And I think they minimized the authority of God. And then and then they fled after, um, you know, that brooding spirit of just believing lies before you would believe the truth. Anybody else? I'd say it speaks to the, hold on, motorcycle. 
that speaks to the dynamics of, of what it means to believe. I mean, I used to just say, believe means trust. But if you read the book of John, he uses faith and belief in a lot of synonyms, like to receive Christ, uh, to love, just as Paul's doing here, love and believe are pretty synonymous. They're kind of different side, different facets of the same diamond, so to speak. And similar, similar to Harold, the love of the truth obviously does refer to how not, of course, not the unbelievers, you know, not the one who uh, uh, are going to be saved, those who, uh, who are going to perish. But it does, it sounds like uh, the believers who embrace it, they love this truth. Um, so, I mean, it, it almost sounds like Paul's describing, and obviously not the believers, but the typical response believers have to the gospel. They, they love this truth, and unbelievers don't. And then when he talks about the, simply the truth in verse 12, I think it stands in contrast to what's false, first of all, because in the same verse, he, he says, uh, in order that they all may be judged, uh, wait, uh, let's see verse 11 for this reason god will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what's false and then verse 12 they didn't believe what was true so obviously if it was a pure comparison he may be sticking to that language um but um but it's interesting that he says Okay, when we talk of believers in the gospel, Paul's referring or describing us, us, I think, as loving the truth. But it, when, it ta when Paul talks about the unbelievers, he says that they took pleasure in wickedness. We love truth, but they love wickedness. He, he, they took pleasure in it. So I kind of see that there is some sort of parallel as well as a contrast that Paul seems to be using here um but I, I just thought that was kind of interesting that uh he he frames it differently each each in those two verses anybody else have any observation about that i i love the love of the truth i you know when i became when i became convinced of the doctrines of grace and not just them but i have to admit those are things, those truths really became solidified in my life in early years of pastoring at First Baptist. I had people influence me, but that I landed squarely on those truths was after a few years here. And it, it was such a, I had such a love for those truths. Um, you know, and I, I, I know other guys do too. And of course, we all love the truth of the gospel. We all love that. Well, let me, uh, well, I was, I was going to ask, you know, what verses teach God saw over everything? There's a lot of them, and I, you probably could remember some of them. But how is, is God's sovereignty comforting to believers going through trials? Just try to answer that. How is the sovereignty of God comforting to believers going through trials? Bill, I've been, uh, I read a little book, or our family read a little book recently by John Piper that he wrote about uh, the coronavirus and Christ. So just about what God's doing. And one of the phrases that he, that he wrote, uh, I'll see if I can remember it right, he's he was talking about, you know, why, why doesn't God stop this, right? Or can God stop it? You know, some, some people might say, well, God, uh, you know, God didn't do this. It's, you know, he's just reacting to it. He'll turn it to something good. And Piper said, no, that's not a very good, uh, a good thought. Because if God isn't sovereign enough, if, if God isn't powerful enough to stop it, in the first place, then who's to say he's powerful enough to turn it to good? But he said, the God who is powerful enough to stop the coronavirus, but chooses not to, 
okay, is the God who can sustain believers through it. And, and so I think the same, you know, similar sort of thought uh, with this as to why would God, you know, bring the man of lawlessness or, you know, why would he, would he do this? If we, if we take a, if, if we take a different position, then it's that God's not powerful enough to stop this bad thing that happens. And that's not a position that you want to be in because then you have no trust that God will work it all out for good in the end. Right. I mean, logic demands uh, a, a comfort in a God who's completely controlled. At least for those who love him, those who are his. You can understand the terror on the part of those who don't believe it and, and don't want to even give it a thought. Yeah, those, those people you can understand. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Comfort in the sovereignty of God. Glad he's in control. Not out of control. And therefore, there's meaning to it. There's purpose to it. And God solves it by telling us his purpose is good. Melissa, are you going to say something? Yeah, just come and knowing his promises are true. He's faithful in his promises. Yeah. Anybody else? Thanks, Harold. Thank you, everybody. Good to see many of you there today. Yeah, so we'll move into our uh, prayer time now. And... Uh, uh, this is our opportunity to share any specific prayer requests that you might have. Um, certainly continue to remember Rose and uh, both her physical recovery as well as being comforted with the loss of her mother. I believe her mother's funeral was on Thursday this past week. So remember, remember Rose. Um, you know, sir, she she enjoys the, the calls and the visits. If you may just have to time it between a, a, a treatment that she has or physical therapy that session that she has and a little bit of time to recover from that. Did they actually have a funeral? Graveside. Graveside only with family. With family. Okay. Yeah. So, hey, so remember, uh, you know, the visitors that we had today, um, you know, I think we mentioned at least a thumbnail. Joe from Clark's Hill, uh, the couple that, that came from Flora. The Dotteries. The Dotteries, yeah. Sorry, didn't get that uh, down. Um, and then the, the friend, Tony's friend that, that came with him, and then Noah and Christina this morning as well. Mm -hmm. Just remember those folks, and uh, some may be searching, some may just be looking for a fellowship. Uh, you know, in the interim here, but, um, you know, continue to encourage them. You know, pray for those that are, that are shut-ins, um, certainly Mary and Carolyn, Marilyn Collins, uh, Janie Ryder, you know, certainly we can remember her, her as well. Uh, and then as always, you know, pray for unsafe family members. And as we have opportunity to uh, give a give a testimony for the hope that we have within us with with people that the Lord draws into our life, maybe it's in, infrequent, but I'm hearing a lot awful lot of stories about people uh, visiting with neighbors that they haven't talked to for a long, long time, and and that type of thing. So those those are a few things that are on my heart. What what other prayer requests might you have today? Remember to mute yourself in order to uh, chime in. Remember Justin's mom. She's doing better. We saw her yesterday. She's getting around with a cane, so that was encouraging. And um, But she's seen the doctor, and he thinks there's still some infection in her back, in her disc. So she may have to be facing surgery pretty soon to have that removed and put a rod and pins in her back. Melissa, was she scheduled for an MRI this week, or has that happened? Hasn't happened yet. Okay. 
So remember Darlene. She's having a therapist come in. Well, I'm not sure if it's therapist, more of a helper, I guess. And she's really encouraging um, his mom to go through things. And so this is good on many fronts. So this is good. She's doing some organizing and that's giving her something to do and getting her stronger at the same time. So praise God for, I think is Michelle is her name. So thankful for her. It's, remember Darlene and Michelle for, for helping. You know, you, you don't know that how God will bring people into others, others' lives is to be an encouragement. You might remember both the Sonnies, too, in prayer. Yeah, Sonny Felix. Yes. And, and Sonny Bishop, and thanks to you. How are you doing, Donna? Have a good Can you unmute her? Yeah, Donna, you're unmuted. Oops. There you go. You're good, Donna. I think you're unmuted. I'm doing well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the Lord. Good. Good to see Wayne and Dixie. Yeah. You. How many did you have this morning in church? I think about 88. Yeah, I counted 85. Wow, that's great. Any, any other specific prayer requests? Certainly, you know, wisdom for wisdom for the church leadership in the, in the days ahead when, you know, John brought up a good, good question. When do we transition to a more full, uh, and normal service, and, and we need that wisdom. We need, am I muted? No. no. We, need to, we need to really pray for our nation and the turmoil we're in, the anarchy and the um, unrest that's all around and innocent people being killed in the midst of it. And it, just the confusion, we just need, our leaders need wisdom and uh, protection for our police officers. Yeah. Just protection for first responders, period. And Eli read yesterday that some firemen in Georgia were shot at, had to wear bulletproof vests. So just prayer for all first responders. All right. Remember the medical staff and those folks that are, you know, like Eli that and uh, Caitlin that are on that front line of, of uh, you know, working with patients, you know, that, that are probably in compromised health anyway. So remember, remember them as well. John Piper has a prayer about all of this happening in Minnesota. And he referenced the Ninevites and God being merciful to these people. And he said, you know, to a people who do not know their left hand from their right. And just things seem so backwards, so upside down and not, not as they should be. Just to pray for people, for God's mercy. Amen. Well, let's, re let's remember these, and, and uh, as, as you have opportunity to share with one another, we may be more personal prayer requests as well. And uh, today I've asked Steve Brummett if he would lead us in prayer. And Steve, if you can remember a few of these that were mentioned today, and and thank the Lord for our time together. All right. Our Heavenly 
Father, we come for you with praise and adoration. Thank you, Father, that we have your word before us and that you've opened our hearts to those truths, to understanding. And I pray, Father, as you've opened our hearts, that we would then go forth to spread the good news, to spread these truths to the ones that are around us as opportunities are before us. And the Father, our, our minds and our hearts would always be looking for these opportunities to share your word. And the Father, even through our thinking, our actions and our word, would be glorified. You would be honored. Father, specifically, we come before you and we think about uh, family members who are not saved. Uh, many of us have, have these and you know are that our hearts yearn for their salvation. But we understand about being ours, that they're yours. And the Father, truly that before the creation of this earth, you have sent forth and you have your chosen. You have your people. But we continue to lift them up in prayer. And we rest in knowing that your truth and your understanding is beyond ours. And we give you thanks for that. We think about both the Sunnies in our, in our congregation, that uh, you be with them. We know with Sonny Feely Pete that uh, some of his numbers have risen back up. We pray for, first of all, his thinking that it would be right, that we've been focused around you. And we pray for those that are in his care, for the doctors and nurses, and give them wisdom on how to go forth and to treat him. And for Sonny Bishop, we, we pray along the same lines that you also be with him. And, uh, with the family that had seasons before them on things that are coming up in the near future for his care. For Father, we think about uh, the disrupt disruptions going on around this country and this world with this virus and uh, the ones that are caring for the ones who are sick with this the doctors and nurses, first responders, and then also uh, with this that is going on for Minneapolis and how it's spread out uh, across this country. We pray, Father, that hearts would come to you through this and that peace might soon abide back in the streets. Father, we thank you for the visitors today. Um, pray that their uh, hearts might be touched and that they might return. And above all, Father, that uh, the truths that were taught today would rest in their hearts. For each of us, as we go forward this week and the days ahead of us, I pray, Father, that it truly would be to glorify you, to honor you, that each day our minds would be renewed and we would always be in your word, uplifting you and giving you praise in all things, even our trials and tribulations, knowing that uh, all things are in your hands, and that truly, Father, we need to glorify you. From what we deserve, we are so blessed. And these things we lift you up and give you praise in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, thanks for everyone, too. It's good see, seeing everybody uh, kind of two times today. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to keep, keep that. Well, so this is a time just enjoy fellowship as long as you're, you like and are able to, to stay online. You don't have to. I'm going to go check my phone. Oh.
whispering and she was on mute. It's kind of funny. Pat Patrick and Kim, you, you hear anything from Danielle? You doing well? If you're still muted. Yeah, we saw them Friday night. Yeah, they're doing good. She has a little baby bump now. <laughs> oh boy, that's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, look at look at Naomi. This is our daughter doing a McDonald's, our granddaughter doing a McDonald's commercial. <laughs> Jared sent me that today. <laughs> oh boy. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> just, yeah. just hold it just a second. The other group. I'm sure. Okay, now hold no. it back up. I hold it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She got that smile. Looks yeah. just like her brother. What, looks like what? It's just like her brother. Oh. There. Yeah. She looks like she was loving it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, she's ready for a break today. <laughs> so I got a text this morning after I got home from church from my neighbor. Um, she said, this morning when I was on the porch, I could hear your church singing. And the, Glen and the German shepherd would howl while the music was going. <laughs> he was singing with you. Drew has his dog here. German shepherd. German shepherd, so that she was tied up in the house or closed up in the house, but she was howling while we were singing. A neighbor could hear. Yeah, we had the church windows and doors open today, so people outside could hear us gathering. Oh, yeah. Definitely a lot better than last year. Do, do any of you know um, Tim and Jennifer Edsel? Mm -hmm. um, their oldest daughter got married um, the 23rd of uh, May. Really? Yes, Abby. She couldn't have the big wedding, you know, like everyone couldn't be there, so they live streamed it. But um, it just looked like it was a, they had a lot of attendance, but it, was mainly just their family that was there at the church it looked like so um but yeah they live streamed the wedding through youtube yeah yeah my mom and i watched it yes yeah i hope the rest of my kids will do that it'll really cut down on the cost <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's someone else again. At least on the food part, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Do we have a virtual wedding dress? That could cut down on costs. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it looks like uh, the Glenn's granddaughter is being unsupervised right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Are you all alone? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> that Glenn legacy continues. <laughs> Brother. Well, our house is quiet right now, but in about an hour and a half, it's going to get really loud. Everybody will be back, and we're going to do a birthday party for Silas and Sean. Oh. Yeah. So we'll have a full house. I feel like you're talking to someone. Oh. Are the, are the, are the police there? <laughs> Is Child Protective Services there? <laughs> that's, what, that's what Patrick wants to know. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know how to unmute it now. That's trouble. Does Gunner know how to unmute? That's what I want to know. 
He does. Oh no. <laughs> Where'd he go? He's right here. Oh, they moved. Where's your mom gather? She's she's talking to your friends and my dad's talking to the same person. No, oh, okay. My mom is taking a nail. Aww. She's taking look at you. <laughs> Never know what that guy's going to say. So it's always worth asking him. <laughs> oh, my. Well, we're going to take off because we're, we're getting ready. So good to see you all. Thanks for the fellowship. I, I hope most can return next week. That would be great. Oh, and the picnic. Don't forget about the picnic. We're not doing it next week. The picnic. We have a picnic. But we're not doing yep. it. No, we're not oh. doing it. Yeah, we won't be doing this. No. Okay. Bye. Love you. Bye-bye. 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 Sorry, I missed you. We got someone came by. Bye. 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 Okay, bye for my mom. For my mom. Bye-bye. Bye. I think she's regular. You need to turn it off. Okay. Well, keep saying it. goodbye, Annabelle. Bye. That's all right. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll sign off for now. God bless.